disqualify ourselves from partaking in the gospel because we want the gospel, right? We want eternal life too. Unless we go on preaching some message, some religious message, maybe even some accurately biblical message, we don't want to disqualify ourselves from partaking in the gospel by not emptying ourselves and identifying with those under the law, those without the law, the weak, the poor, those caught up in sin, the heathens. We don't want to disqualify ourselves by failing to identify with them and thinking we are more pious than them, more religious than they are. In chapter 10 here, Paul explains his reasoning which is really exciting because sometimes Paul doesn't explain his reasoning. He just kind of tells you what he thinks. But in chapter 10, he explains his reasoning. Why should we be voluntary slaves to one another and to those outside the church? Why, why does Paul hit this idea of relating to those outside of the church? I, even identifying with those outside the church. Why does he hit it so hard and why does he make this a matter of salvation? Talking about disqualification from partaking in the gospel if we don't identify with wretched people, with sinners. I'm glad he explains himself starting in chapter 10. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. I'll read this passage in its entirety and then we'll walk through verse by verse like we normally do. Paul continues his letter, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses, in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. And nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not pray evil things as they also prayed. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Paul begins in chapter 10, verse 1. This word in English is rendered for. It could also be rendered because. Right? This is the reason. This is the reason you, church, need to identify with sinners. This is the reason, contrary to popular religion, you should go into those places that Christian people shouldn't be seen in. This is the reason you should go there. 
This is the reason you should associate with people that Christian people shouldn't associate with. This is the reason you should identify with sinners and gluttons and drunkards and those under the law, those without the law, Gentiles, those who are weak and those who are poor. This is why you should associate with them, talk with them, have a drink with them, go to their homes, go to their parties, yet without sin, but go, be with them, partake with them in the things that you can. This is why you should, and this is why such fruit reveals whether or not we are actually in Christ and care about the things Christ cares about. For I do not want you to be unaware. This is a constant theme through Paul's letter here in 1 Corinthians and other letters, right? I don't want you to be unaware. Paul wants other Christians to be aware of what it means to live godly lives, what it means to love Christ, what it means to live for Christ, what, what it means to know Christ deeply. He doesn't want them to be dumb. He doesn't want them to be idiots concerning the things of God. He wants them to be aware of what God wants. He doesn't want them to be blinded by their limited mental capacity. He doesn't want them to be blinded by their religiosity, the things that they perceive, their experiences. He, he doesn't want them to be immobilized by what they think religion is. He doesn't want them to come up with excuses to dumb down the gospel and the application of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wants them to be aware and Paul, being here inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this, making application um, figuratively to himself, to the church at Corinth, and, and through the church at Corinth to us now, brothers and sisters, we should not be unaware of the things of God. We want to know God deeply. We want to apply Scripture well better than we did last week and the week before or last year and the year before. We want to see who God is and what God wants from us. We, brothers and sisters, do not want to be unaware. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud. Well, I walk outside of my house sometimes monsoon season and I am under the cloud. Yeah. Oh, in fact, I back up my files to the cloud. My files are under the cloud. I think here Paul was making a particular reference to the Exodus narrative. Where there was a cloud and that cloud was Christ leading the people of Israel from Egypt to the promised land, right? They were under the cloud, following the pillar of fire in the same narrative, and all passed through the sea. A wet sea. I can pass through the sea pretty easily today. That's not a difficult thing to do. What makes this so great? Passing through the sea. This is the same Exodus narrative where the, the people of Israel, God's chosen nation, came out of Egypt and they were fleeing. Pharaoh, and they came to a sea, and they were freaking out, started grumbling against God. Do you remember this story? And God instructed Moses to put his staff in the water, and to stir the waters, and the sea split, and the water stood up, and there was dry ground. And the nation of Israel walked across on dry ground. This is miraculous. So Paul is bringing the miraculous into this. This cloud that leads the nation miraculously or providentially. The water miraculously standing up so the nation of Israel could walk across the sea on dry ground. 
He says, all were baptized into Moses in this cloud and in this sea. They didn't actually get wet. They walked across on dry grounds. This isn't quite the baptism we talk about when we talk about baptism. People aren't getting wet in this case. Now, when we practice believers' baptism, we baptize in water to represent the salvation of Jesus Christ. The fact that we die to ourselves, we are buried with Christ, we are raised with Him in new life, thus being completely immersed in coming back to the surface. That's important, right? We don't want to leave people under the water. We bring them back to the surface. It represents the new life and it keeps people alive. Okay? But these people weren't baptized like that. I said this kind of baptism, baptizo, is, which means immersion, right? This kind of immersion is immersion in the physical salvation that God brings to a nation. So they're not being baptized into Moses for the salvation of their souls. They're being baptized into Moses as a type of Christ for the salvation of the nation, of their bodies. So that they can go and worship God without the Egyptians oppressing them. Baptizing the Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. What did they do once in the wilderness? So they, 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 they complained. They grumbled because their stomachs grumbled. Right? And in response, God smote them. No, God didn't smite them. Instead, miraculously, bread started raining from heaven. And they ate this miraculous food. But these people witnessed some miracles. They experienced God. The, they, they experienced the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit counseled and, and dealt with Moses' heart. They experience Christ as we're about to see. Look at this. They all eat the same spiritual food and all drink the same spiritual drink. There's this story during this exodus where Moses is instructed once to strike a rock and once to speak to a rock. And both times water comes from the rock and Israel drinks this spiritual drink, this life-saving drink. They're thirsty in the desert and water miraculously comes from a rock. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. And then Paul says that the rock was Christ. So they experienced Christ, right? Uh, I don't think the rock was literally Christ. That would be some weird sort of transubstantiation where the rock like, becomes Christ. I don't, I don't think that's happening. That wasn't the incarnation. Okay? But that rock was a type of Christ. And what Christ would do at the cross, providing this living water, the well of living water that comes up within a person that never runs dry and you never thirst again. And rock was the type of Christ. And rock was Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. Like, so the people experienced God's providence. And they experienced miracles. And they experienced the, the Spirit in Moses, and they experience Christ in the rock and in, and in the cloud, I'm sure they experience these things. They experience the wonders and the signs, and, and, and you're often like, man, what a cool experience that would have been, right? To live then, to see God doing all these mighty works. How amazing would that be? I think that would be pretty amazing. See fire coming down from heaven and with God at work. Right? For God to make things so clear, the direction of our lives so clear that we're just following a cloud and going right where we need to go. Say, God, I am so hungry and bread falls from the sky. I am so thirsty, God, water comes out of a rock to, to quench our thirst. Like, to experience these kinds of miracles, that would be amazing. But then look at verse 5. 
Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased. People put so much value in experiencing God. Experiencing the Holy Spirit through gifts or through fill goodness. Experiencing Christ. People put such value in those things. Do you not realize God had an entire nation of people? Witness his miracles, experience the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right there. Yet God was never well pleased with them. What if instead of experiencing God, we should be just more concerned about pleasing him? With most of them, God was not well pleased. For, here's the evidence that God was not well pleased with them, they were laid low in the wilderness. Remember, they got to Canaan. But they were such idolaters that God didn't allow them to go in. He sentenced them to 40 more years in the wilderness. You can read Exodus. Read the whole thing, right? 40 more years in the wilderness. They were laid low in the wilderness because they did not please God. They experienced God. Now here's what this means, and this is crazy. We experience God. We experience His miracles. We experience His providence. We experience the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We experience them. Y'all, that's nothing special. God is always working. He is everywhere. He's always doing stuff. It's not hard to experience God. It's not hard to have a spiritual experience anywhere you go. But this nation of people experienced God and they still were not pleasing to Him. He sentenced them to 40 more years in the wilderness where they would continue to experience Him. And they would continue to be concerned about experiencing Him. You want to know why the state of religion on earth today is hell. I will tell you. People are so caught up in experiencing God that they never please Him. That's what was happening with Israel. This is the way Paul is pleading with the church of Corinth, admonishing them, saying, please empty yourselves of you. Your experiences don't matter. They can be good. They can be beneficial. But they are not a measure of whether or not you are in Christ. You can feel the Spirit move. You can put the puzzle pieces together and see the providence of God, attribute that to God. You can do that. You can rejoice in miracles when they happen. Y'all, I was healed from, from asthma at a young age before I was in Christ. I was not in Christ. Me experiencing a miracle does not mean I had eternal life at, at that point, right? It doesn't mean I had taken the gift that Christ was going to give me at that point. Being spiritual is nothing special. Having Christ is. And when we have Christ, we empty self. So being so concerned about what I am experiencing, what I, whether I feel like a Christian or not, whether I'm feeling the Spirit moving, right? Your people say that all the time, I just don't feel the Spirit moving. So, does that mean all of a sudden the Spirit's not moving? Ye of little faith. Being in Christ is about emptying ourselves, not filling ourselves. It's the kind of life Christ leads us to. Verse 6, Paul continues, Now these things happened. Wait. The stories, wait, the stories we read in the Old Testament happened. If you want to leave the Old Testament and only take the New Testament, understand the New Testament claims that these things happened. The Exodus happened. 
the creation account, Genesis 1 and 2, it happened. Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, happened. Joshua, Judges, happened. And the whole thing, what we read in the, in the prophets and the testimony we read in the Psalms and the book of Job, it happened. Like, that's real stuff. These things happened. Oh, well, why did they happen? As examples for us. So that we would not crave evil things as they also craved evil things. What evil things is Paul talking about here? What evil things were the nation of Israel caught up in? Look at their religion. They get out of Egypt. Look at their lives in general. If you don't like religion, what are you going to do? Just look at their lives, right? They, they get out of Egypt. God rescues them, brings them out of Egypt. Complain. Grumble. God, why haven't you provided this for me? Selfishness. Instead of trust. Rather than an emptying of self, they're looking to fill self. These things happen as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. Paul is going to explain this a little bit more. Do not be idolaters. That's what it means to be evil, to be an idolater. The first sin we ever commit is idolatry. We come out of our mother's wombs and we cry. Why do we cry? Because we're hungry. That's the only thing on our mind is to fill ourselves. From the moment we are born, idolaters at heart, it's an idolatry of self. Condemned to hell from our very first sound. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, and he goes back to Exodus, the story of the golden calf. The people sat down to eat and drink after worshiping and sacrificing this golden calf. What they're eating and drinking, it's the stuff sacrificed to this golden calf, right? To eat and drink and stood up to play a word there that carries sexual, sensual connotations, right? All around this golden calf. This is about me. This is about me satisfying my hunger, my thirst, my pleasures, my sensibilities, me filling me, and Yahweh is not giving me that. Moses is up on that mountain. So Aaron, let's create our own religion here. We saw the Egyptians worshiping the Egyptian gods in order to gain something from them. Hey, let's fashion our own idol, our own golden calf to gain something from it. To gain good food and drink and to satisfy our urges by playing and dancing. I don't think this means dancing is evil. I do think it means that living only to satisfy our own lusts is, and sometimes dancing is used for that purpose. Paul says, don't be like that. Do not be idolaters. Verse 8, nor let us act immorally. As some of them did, immorally, they're also having sexual connotations, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. Yeah, God did that. Again, read Exodus. Nor let us try the Lord, test Him, as some of them did. And were destroyed by the serpents. That's part of the story, right? The people made this idol. God sent serpents. And the people cried out to Moses. And Moses went to God on their behalf and constructed a bronze serpent so that they could just look at the serpent and be saved. And then that serpent that they would look at, that's actually a type of Christ too, like the rock. And so God is he's, he's faithful. Even though His people are sinning and even though He is uh, dealing just punishment and discipline. And Paul is saying, you don't want to be like that. Church of Corinth, you don't want to be like that. 
nor grumble. This is, this is where I want to rest for a little bit. Grumbling in the church. Apparently it's prevalent in the church of Corinth for people to grumble. People today grumble about all sorts of things. Uh, some grumble because they're hungry and thirsty, like the Israelites did. Some grumble because their lives aren't working out. Some grumble because, I know Christianity really doesn't work for me to so grumble. But Christianity isn't designed to work for you. God doesn't work for you. People grumble all the time because they don't get their way. Their preferences aren't met. Their expectations aren't met. Whatever expectations they have of, of others or themselves, right? Their expectations aren't met. Their pleasures aren't being satisfied. And their sensibilities are not being honored. So they grumble. Whether in public or in secret, they grumble. Being malicious and gossips, they grumble. At any time they begin to speak about something, it ultimately turns into grumbling. Have you noticed that with, with people who claim to know Christ and really have no idea what it means to be in Christ? Life is grumbling. But Paul says, don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that like the Israelites did. Some of them, they were destroyed by the destroyer. Who's the destroyer? Satan? The destroyer? They were destroyed by the destroyer? Is Paul here saying that those who are given over to grumbling, people who are grumblers that they are handed over to Satan to be devoured by him? Is this part of what disqualifies someone from partaking in the gospel? Having a grumbler sort of lifestyle which is evidence of not having been saved in the first place? Are you a grumbler? Don't be grumblers church at Corinth. Don't want to be destroyed by the destroyer. This is a salvific issue. It's an issue concerning your salvation, your souls, your eternal life. Verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction. So we gain some insight on how to interpret narratives in the Old Testament, right? They're not just narratives that exist. They're actually written as examples. But not just as examples, also as instruction. We are to read the narratives of the Old Testament as instruction. We gain that insight here. These things were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Wait. Christ said, back yet? We're not. This isn't a seven year tribulation. There hasn't been a rapture yet. Right? How, how can these be the ends of the ages? Well, Paul is writing in the first century, and he's writing having believed Christ. When Christ said his kingdom was at hand in his incarnation, established in his incarnation, Christ's kingdom to be. To be finished at his return, but established at his incarnation. Paul's writing from this perspective. Paul believes Jesus. And it turns out that believing Jesus just makes Paul quite the post millennium. The ends of the ages have come. These are the end times. These are the times in which Christ is building his church, his kingdom. The 
that God's kingdom is coming to this earth and His will is being done on this earth as it is in heaven. And this, these are those ages. These are the ends of the ages. These are the ages in which the, the wheat and the weeds are being sifted, or the weeds are being sifted from the wheats. The sheep are being separated from the goats. These are those ages. That's happening now. This is Paul's eschatology here. This, these are the ends of the age, and he's writing the first century. This is the time when God is sanctifying his church. This is. But this is not happening later. We're not just, oh, come to Christ and live your life and later you'll be sanctified. No, sanctification is happening now. That's why Paul is admonishing the church. If sanctification wasn't happening, there would be no reason to admonish anyone. Right? Go live your life. And God will do it later. Paul's admonishing the church. Why? Because he believes he's in the, the ends of the ages. He believes the kingdom of Christ is overtaking the world. And he believes the sanctification of Christ's kingdom people is happening in the first century. Christ hasn't returned yet, so I imagine it's still happening. Right? The ends of the ages have come. There, therefore, why? Because the ends of the ages have come. Because Christ is doing this sanctified work. Because He's building His kingdom now and His kingdom is overtaking the world. Therefore, let, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Oh, the church better listen up here. Because when we think we stand, when we think we are on solid ground, religiously speaking, as Christians, or Jews as Jews, I think it applies to Muslims as Muslims, to Hindus as Hindus, to Mormons as Mormons, to Jehovah's Witnesses as Jehovah's Witnesses. This, this applies across the board. Applies to Catholics as Catholics. This applies across the board. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall, that he does not fall. Consider this context. What does it take for us to think that we stand on some kind of solid ground? Like, what does that even take? What sort of mentality do I have to have? I sort of have to have, like, a superiority complex, don't I? My religion is the right religion. My way of thinking is the, the right way of thinking. My church is the, the only, the only, the only option, the only church. The way I do things is the best way to do things. My morality is the best morality. My opinion is what matters. My preferences are what matter. My expectations are what matter. My pleasures are what matter. My sensibilities are the sensibilities that really matter. So you have all these Christians refusing to, under the context, identify with the wretched people of the world. Refusing to go have a beer with their neighbor because what you do for that. Forcing their pastors to present themselves as somehow better or more pious than anyone else, expecting some level of perfection there. Not even according to a biblical standard, but their own, really. Returning once again to the idea of churches, congregations forcing their pastors, their elders to live in sin. Disqualifying them from ministry, by the way, so that they don't lose their job. So their ministries are Ill Ill illegitimate. Because they're forced not to be able to identify with people, the people of the world. Instead, we look down our noses at the people of the world. We're better than man. We're better than that. We're more pious, we're more religious. We, oh, we feel the Spirit in here. We ain't out there. I'm trying to tell the Holy Spirit where he can and can't go. Please, I don't think that's going to work out for you.
Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Fall into what? Disqualification. Disqualification from partaking in the gospel. If you read this in context, this is a salvific issue. Paul's talking about disqualification from partaking in the gospel. If you think you stand and you are better than others, be very careful the road you are going down. If you refuse to identify with others because of their age, because of their habits, because they got a little dirt on their boots, be very careful the road you're going down, the street you're walking. Because there's a fall, a fall that actually disqualifies you from eternal life. It's an indication, right? It disqualifies you from partaking in the gospel. As we discovered last week, I'm going to make a clarification here. This isn't some sort of works-based righteousness. Our works always disqualify us from eternal life. The wages of sin is death. There's only the gift of God that brings eternal life. But if this is our lifestyle, this this self-idolatry, Paul is getting at here. For Israel, it was like a golden calf, idolatry. Like, there was an idol there. But Paul starts this out talking about the idolatry of self. Preferences, expectations. He's calling that the same thing here. The Western church is a fine example of what it means to idolatrize self. Take heed lest you fall. Take heed lest you go to hell. When you are fully convinced of your own salvation, take heed. These are Paul's words. Verse 13. No temptation. By the way, I'm about to prove how we have idolatrized self by reading the next verse. 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. And not only do we cap that verse halfway through, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. That's how we hear it, right? God won't give you more than you can handle. You don't do that. Oh, God would never. God would certainly do that, all right? My life is more than I can handle. I I can admit that. I hope you can too. I think God does that on purpose. And how have you heard this verse presented? First of all, this verse is just plucked from its context and presented by itself, right? Hey, don't you know that you're not going through anything else that that somebody else hasn't gone through? You personally, you, you have not. Everything you're experiencing, it's common to man. There are no temptations you have to die by what is common to man. It might be true. Well, it's not what this verse is saying, okay? And you know what? I know it's really difficult for you to fight that temptation. But don't you know that, that God would not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear? You don't have to give in to that temptation. Oh, no, y'all. I've had some temptations in my life that I've just not been able to bear. And looking back now, I'm like, there's no way I could have, like, not done that. I didn't... I wasn't strong enough to do anything then. Like, and here you're teaching me from the Bible that I can bear all the temptation that comes my way. I am able to deny it. Able to endure it. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Now, doesn't, doesn't that sound though exactly like what the, what, the, what the verse is saying? Like you. Personally. I want to point out something very important called context. Can I do that? Please. 
Who is Paul talking to here? Is he talking to any individual? No. He's talking to a group of people, a congregation. Now, the Greek language does something spectacular. In English, we have the word you, Y-O-U. And I can be referring to you or all y'all. You, all of you, right? But in Greek, you can tell when you is singular or plural. And here it just so happens to be plural. Paul's not addressing an individual. He's addressing church body, congregation, which changes the way we, we read this, like from our, from our American eyeglasses, right? And the way we've been raised up and the way we've heard this verse presented over and over and over and over again in American individualistic society. We can read this verse with fresh eyes. Now knowing the context, Paul is talking to a church. He's urging the church toward unity through maturity. He's talking about identifying with sinners, with those who are wretched. And he says, no temptation has overtaken the congregation. Now that sounds a little different, doesn't it? No temptation has overtaken the congregation, but such as is common to man, every group, every nation, such as is common to man. Well, what is that? That we turn our focus inward, that we build nations and churches after our own expectations, preferences, pleasures, sensibilities. And that's, in fact, that's the, the very particular temptation Paul is referring to here. And it is tempting to build stuff the way we want to rather than the way God wants us to. This is the temptation. But hey, we're going to build this organization. Here's what I think needs to happen. These are the expectations I think we need to have. I prefer it this way. I would be very pleased if we did things this way. And oh, by the way, we need to make sure we honor this standard of sensibility. It is a standard that we develop rather than look into Scripture and see what God's expectations and preferences and pleasures and sensibilities are and trying our best to please Him. That's what this whole passage is about, right? That's what chapters 9 and 10, they're all about this. It's all, it's all leading up. It's all, it's all the same argumentation here. No temptation has overtaken the congregation but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. We'll praise Him for that. Even the, even the church that is in danger of getting into this temptation, being overcome. In fact, Paul notices the church in Corinth is being overtaken by this temptation. That's his language here. The church of Corinth is being overtaken by this temptation towards self-idolatry. It's like, you can plant a healthy church. Boom. Expository, biblical relationships based on grace. You establish elders who are able to deny themselves. You, you teach the gospel. You strive for sound doctrine. You practice church discipline. You're admonishing one another, correcting one another. And temptation overtakes the congregation. Remember, this is the church that Paul planted. Pretty sure Paul did it well. If they were overtaken by this temptation, this temptation is common to man. There is no local church that is exempt from this temptation. Inward turning. Focus on purpose. Expectations. Our pleasures. Our sensibilities. Rejecting the outside world. Separating ourselves from the outside world. And throwing anyone out who contradicts anything we already believe. Right? No temptation has overtaken you, congregation, such as coming to man. Yet God is faithful. And you wonder why God doesn't just zap churches that turn this way. Why we don't see more fire from heaven. There's a lot of churches being burned up, I think. Buildings anyway. God is faithful. 
I don't know what that means for each congregation. All I know is, man, God is way better than the people deserve. Showing more mercy, showing more grace. God is faithful. He's faithful to his plan, faithful to his calling, faithful to building his kingdom. And if he has any people in those churches, he's he is faithful to his people. In fact, he's just faithful, period. Right? Faithful to accomplish the work he has even for those who are not in Christ. And yes, he raises up people who are not in Christ to do certain works in this world. Because he is sovereign. God is faithful. Who will not allow you congregation, so here being applied particularly to the church at Corinth, which Paul still believes to be a legitimate local church, we learn that in the first chapter, who will not allow you, congregation, church at Corinth, to be tempted beyond what you are able. You're going to be tempted toward this inward turn. But you, not you individually, each person, you local church, this is important. Oh, how did we miss this growing up? How have we missed this in all the sermons we've heard on 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13? Beyond what you, congregation, are able, local church is able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. This temptation is coming. This temptation is coming for every single local church, for every group, for every nation, for every religion, right? This temptation is common to man. You local church will face this. Be prepared for this. You are able to withstand this. You will be able to endure this. Local church, not individual. So you have one with Christianity. Everybody trying to endure their own sin and power through it, and it's not possible. Sanctification happens in the context of a local church. That's where the work is done. That's where the work's done. That's where the work on our hearts is done. That's where the transforming of our minds takes place. The local church as we admonish and correct and encourage and rebuke one another for our good. That's where it happens in the context of a local church, not each individual. And if the local church is being a local church, and there are godly men in the local church that will recognize, hey, the temptation's here. Y'all are starting to turn inward. Y'all are starting to focus on yourselves. Y'all are starting to redefine your budget. Y'all are starting to redefine your doctrine. Y'all are, are starting to not care about missions. Y'all are starting to not care about reaching people. Oh, y'all are actually condemning your community instead of identifying with people. Oh, y'all are grumbling about your pastor because he cares too much about missions and evangelism. Oh, y'all are complaining about your leadership, your deacons, or your elders because they're actually identifying with your community. And if the church is a legitimate local church, people heed the warning. Like, oh, crap, you're right. We didn't even notice we were doing that. It just sort of happened. Well, yeah, I know. Like, that temptation is common to man. That has given us a way to endure it. We endure it in community. But what is the way? How do we endure temptation like this? What is the way? Paul answers. You ready for this? Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Particularly the idolatry of self. Belief, which you can only do in the context of the legitimate Christian community, right? Not fake church, not hype church, not woke church, legitimate church, community. Flee from idolatry. Empty yourself. Like we learned last week. Now Paul has now come full circle. Again, reminding you. 
empty yourself. Identify with others. You, you're not that important. Well, this, this is going to be a popular message. You're not that important, bro. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, flee from idolatry and idolatry yourself. I call this a personal kenosis, personal emptying. But this takes a lifetime. I don't know, I ain't there yet. Far, far from it. In a way that I don't even understand yet. The more and more to the Holy Spirit, just like taking all the plans that I made, ruining that, and teaching me it's okay, this is what I have for you. It's okay, you don't need that, this is what I have for you. And it continues to happen and continues to happen. I'm like, still experiencing that. The Holy Spirit's not convicting you in that way, and all you're seeing is miracles and signs and wonders, and, and you're experiencing, you're experiencing God, but there's no conviction. I'm sorry to break this news to you. You're running into the open mouth of hell. And you need Christ. You need his gift, eternal life. You need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The brotherhood of the church. These are things we need. And it, it breaks me because it seems like nobody's no local church is really interested in doing this. We need to be interested in doing this. This isn't individualistic. This is all about the local church and the kingdom coming through the local church. That's why I think it's probably sinners. And it ultimately comes down to that. So this is the part two of How to not be a stereotypical church. How to not be that religious. How to not be pious. <laughs> but how to be more like Christ. This is what we strive for. This is what we admonish one another toward. This is Paul's admonition to the church in Portland. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for everything. thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for being so gracious as to come and meet with us and allow us to sit at your feet and learn from you. Lord, we may be the only group around praying this way. God, we ask you to make us less religious. Make us less pious. Make us, make us not superior in the way that we think or act or whatever. Help us not to think we're ever better than anyone else. Instead, we, we, want, to, we want to empty ourselves. filled with your spirit. Too many people want, want to be filled with your spirit but they're not willing to be emptied first. I can't be filled with my empty. It's about emptiness. May we trust less in our experiences. May we not be seekers of signs and wonders. Cause us to simply be sincere and to, and to love people for, the, for their good, not just resorting to flattery or manipulation or anything to make people like us, but being sincerely interested in people's good, which isn't always popular. But God, that's what we need to be for our community and for our world. 
for people we really didn't know. Thank you for loving us. We love you.